New Zealand's waterborne aviation heritage began on Auckland's Waitemata Harbour in the early years of the 20th century, and it closed as the 21st century approached. This is the story of the most notable aircraft that touched down on those waters. On New Year's Day 1915, the first flying boat designed and built in the Southern Hemisphere took off from the Waitemata Harbour here at Auckland. It made its maiden flight with Vivian Walsh at the controls. The Walsh brothers, Vivian and Leo, weren't newcomers to flying. In 1911, Vivian made the first controlled powered flight in New Zealand in a Howard Wright biplane provided by an Auckland syndicate. Later, the syndicate members wanted Vivian to give a public demonstration of the Auckland domain. He refused for safety reasons and parted company with the syndicate. The Walsh brothers' disappointment was matched by a determination to embark on a more ambitious project, to design and build flying boats independently. Their American friend, Reuben A. Dexter, joined them, providing financial support. Construction of the first machine began in 1913, and it was completed the following year. During the evening of the 28th of December, 1914, with the First World War underway in Europe, the Walshers carried the wings, tail and superstructure across the Hobson Bay sewer pipeline on the way to Oraki. The hull had been floated down the harbour earlier, and now all the parts were ready to be assembled. On New Year's Day, 1915, the flying boat lifted off the Waitemata Harbour, with Vivian Walsh at the controls on its maiden flight. They had achieved something no one before them had, they'd flown the first flying boat totally designed and built in the Southern Hemisphere. By March of that year, they'd carried their first passenger, and Vivian was making notable local flights. As a prototype, it was satisfactory, but there were inherent limitations in its design, and its performance was marginal, especially with a passenger aboard. The continuing war on the other side of the world made men eager to join Britain's Royal Flying Corps, the forerunner of the RAF. The Walshers saw an opportunity to train flyers and approached government for a grant. Their request was refused. Undeterred, the brothers began interviewing a number of keen candidates in September 1915. On the 2nd of October, the New Zealand Flying School was in business. Designing, planning and construction of new aircraft continued through into 1916, funded from the fees paid by the flood of applicants itching to learn to fly the aircraft now based at Mission Bay. Young George Bolt couldn't afford the fees, but he was dying to learn to fly. He sought advice from his rich uncle Joe Horn, who approached the Walshers. After much negotiation, George was given a job as an apprentice mechanic. He was expected to work all the hours necessary for 27 shillings and sixpence a week, with a tent thrown in for living quarters. 
20 shillings a week, went back to the flying school to cover tuition fees. By July 1916, he was flying solo. Bolt was to have an enormous influence on the development of the aviation industry in New Zealand throughout a long career. This is Mission Bay Reserve. The bay was named for the mission house over there, which was built in the 1800s to train native Melanesian boys in Christianity. The Walsh brothers built three hangars behind the mission house over there where the busy road runs through today and further back behind that were the workshops and the camp where the workers and the flying school students lived. Throughout the First World War, the Flying School trained many pilots who went on to join Britain's Royal Flying Corps, the forerunner of the RAF. Flying school prospered through the war years, then ran into financial difficulties in the early 1920s. In October 1923, the New Zealand Flying School closed its doors. And shortly after, George Bolt and his new wife boarded the Paddle Ferry Eagle for the trip up the harbour to the city for the last time. A year later, the New Zealand government bought the assets of the Flying School. The remnants of New Zealand's pioneer aviation industry, the planes, the hangars, the equipment, were either burnt, sold or left to rot. This is North Head, one of the many volcanic cones that Auckland's built on. There's Mount Eden, there's Mount Hobson, there's Mount Victoria, there's Rangitoto, of course, at the 
head of the harbour. But it was over here to North Head that the New Zealand Flying School's first two Boeings are rumoured to have been brought. They were supposedly packaged up and deposited in one of the many tunnels that dot this headland. North Head's been a military establishment since the mid-1800s. The rumours have persisted that those two old Boeing aircraft were buried somewhere in these tunnels. Recent excavations have failed to find them. But if they do exist, they'd be the most valuable aircraft in the world. The Walsh brothers quit flying completely, disillusioned and with their unique contribution to New Zealand aviation, unrecognised and unmarked by successive governments. No flying boats graced the Waitemata Harbour for the next 13 years. The first international seaplane flight to New Zealand landed on the Waitemata in March 1937. Captain Edwin Music flew a Sikorsky Pan American Clipper into Auckland before an excited crowd on a survey flight that had begun in San Francisco. The Great Depression was almost over and there was a new mood of optimism in the country. Captain Music was back on Boxing Day that year with the first scheduled international air service to New Zealand. day, Imperial Airways flying boat Centaurus set down on the harbour at the end of a long flight from England, with Captain John Burgess at the controls. New Zealand was now linked to the rest of the world by air. Captain Music flew on to Samoa, and as the big clipper left there on 11th of January 1938, the plane exploded and crashed, killing all aboard. Captain Edwin Music's contribution to the growth of New Zealand's aviation industry was marked by the naming of Music Point, a headland near Eastern Beach. War broke out in Europe for the second time this century in September 1939. In New Zealand, negotiations were taking place to establish our international airline, Tasman Empire Airways Limited, known by the acronym TEAL. Jointly owned by the governments of Britain, Australia and New Zealand, TEAL began flying Trans-Tasman in April 1940, using British-built short S-30 Empire-class flying boats carrying 19 passengers. The trip took between 8 and 10 hours, depending on the weather. Also in April that year, Pan Am began a regular Trans-Pacific service operating the new Boeing 314 flying boats. The California Clipper weighed in at 41 and a half tonnes, almost double the tonnage of the British planes. Within a few short months, New Zealand had moved from aerial isolation from the rest of the world to the luxury of two international airlines flying regularly out of Auckland. The sight of the big flying boats landing on the Waitemata invariably brought Aucklanders to the waterfront to watch the spectacle of the huge planes thundering out of the sky. The patrol launchers clearing boats from the landing path and making sure there was no debris that could damage the aircraft. The wait for the deep V of the hull to touch the water and then the taxi up the harbour to the mooring buoy or tying up at the Braby pontoon where passengers disembarked at Mechanics Bay.
flying boat built by the British manufacturer Short Brothers. From the initial S-30 Empire, they went on to purchase the S-25 Sandringham, the civilian version of the military Sunderland, the long-range reconnaissance craft. The last of the long line of flying boats to sit on the harbour was the beautiful Solent. Developed from the S-45 Seaford, or Sunderland IV, as the military version was known. Only four aircraft of the type Solent Mark IV were built by Short Brothers, specifically for Teal. The sole surviving example in the world of this magnificent seaplane now sits on display at the Museum of Transport and Technology in Auckland. This is the cockpit of a Solent flying boat. At the Short Brothers factory in Northern Ireland, they built just four of this model of Solent. This is the last one left in the world. We're going to have a look at it now with one of the original captains. The Solent flying boat operated out of Auckland Harbour from around 1949 to about 1955. And Eddie Treadray was one of the captains on the Solent. Eddie, what were they like to fly? Well, they were very nice to fly, uh, quite heavy, uh, which was normal for those aeroplanes built at that time. And the idea was that if they built them too lightly, you might be able to do too much damage if you got into bad weather. So they were quite heavy on the controls, but uh, uh, once you got airborne, quite nice. It's a bit bigger than a Morris Minor, isn't it? It is a little bit, yes. Tell me, reds and greens, why is everything painted up red yes. and green? Well, it's uh, when the aeroplane is on the water, the flying boat's on the water, it's classed as a ship. And um, all crew had to learn the uh, parts of the regulations for the prevention of collision at sea, which, as you know, in the sea is red port and green is starboard. Mm -hmm. And so we had the throttles, red for the port, green for the starboard, the same as... The, um, the throttles down here and the, the pitch controls down here. They were, that's why they're marked red and green. Okay, now all the controls across here, Eddie, um, you've got some duplicates over on mm. this side for the co-pilot yes. on the other side. What procedures did you go through to start her up? Oh, to, well, to start them up, um, yep. uh, the engineer would be back in the aft panel there. He would mm -hmm. be switching on the fuel tanks. He'd have the main fuel tanks on. And uh, up here, we would have to have the throttles closed, of course. The pitch would be in, in the, in the fine, fine position. And then we'd have uh, the uh, switches on, to, to put the switches on to start each particular engine as we started one at a time. And the engineer would be priming the engines back on his panel. And uh, we'd just push the starter button. And um, Where's the starter button? Sta oh, good. No, up here somewhere. Let's find <laughs> out now. Uh, the, these are feathering buttons. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think these are the starter buttons here. Mm -hmm. Yes, we push them one at a time, start number one, and then number number four. And if we're in the Braby, um, we had to slip from the Braby, and this control up here. Now what's the Braby? Uh, that's when you're in the, you're parked into the, uh, the Braby is where you've got a, a like a floating pontoon. Yeah. And the, air the aircraft fits in the pontoon, and you load the passengers on, from the pontoon into the aircraft. Whereas if you're not on the pond, not on the Braby, you're out in the buoy, you take them out with a launch. So if you get your engine started, two of them, the one and four, uh, you then slip the the buoy, uh, the Braby, by pulling that control there, and that dropped the line at the back of the aircraft, and off you'd go. Then you start two and three when you're uh, clear of all the um, boats and so forth. And if you're on the on the buoy, you'd start uh, one engine first. And then you'd start the other one, the two out, the one and four, and then the, the radio man who would be downstairs, he would, you'd say, you know, cast off, and he'd throw the, the rope off the bollard, and you'd slip out on the uh, on the water with your two engines going, then start uh, two and three when you got out of clear of all the other boats. So you're a bit of a seaman as well as a oh, flyer. You, you had to be a seaman. Yep. And um, the engineer, he was the man that controlled the um, the mast. When you landed on the water and which, which, which you always did land on the water, and you taxied in. If, you're, if you weren't under control, say you had an engine out, he would be responsible for putting the mast up to warning all other ships that you were not under control. Uh, and also, if you're going into a foreign port like Sydney or uh, any port at all where you had to have uh, spraying done, you had to notify the authorities that you had nobody who was on board that were ill. Mm -hmm. So you'd have the, uh, the Blue Peter up. The, the shipping so well, you applied to the ships when you're on the water. Mm -hmm. Uh, and when you're in the air, of course, you apply to the uh, the Aviation Acts. Totally different, I imagine, from flying a land-based aircraft, taking off from the water. What was it like? Well, the, um, because the, um, the runway on the water is always moving, it's more difficult than taking off on a, um, a land base. Mm 
because the land base, the runway doesn't move, it just stays there. But on the water you get different types of water, you get, uh, the only other problem is what you can do is that you've got more, more uh, chance of taking off in and out of, into wind. Mm -hmm. because you've got a, a greater flexibility of the, of the large amount of runway that's available. Yeah. The only thing you have to watch for is that um, you're not going to be taking off towards um, hangars or buildings. You know, you, you try and get a straight, clear takeoff all the time. What were they like to land? Well, like all aeroplanes, you uh, similarly, you know, you get your nose up, throttling back and bringing your nose up and putting it on in the right place. And that's the difficulty is putting it in the right place because if the sea's calm or relatively calm, uh, you can put it down uh, where you want to put it. But if you've got, a, a, say, a heavy sea, you've got to be able to hold the aircraft in the air and drop it behind the sea that's, that's as, it, as it goes forward, you drop, you drop the aircraft down just on the back of the wave so that you're into the trough and then before the next wave comes over you. Mm -hmm. Because if you drop the aircraft in the front of the wave, you're going to, well, the nose will go down. Yeah. See, so and the nose will go down the, the, uh, the front of the wave, whereas if you land from the back, your nose is up. And the maximum speed's what, 250 knots? Well, that was the maximum speed for the design of the, um, of the structure. Yeah. That's fairly slow by today's standards, isn't it? Uh, well, it depends what altitude you're at. Yeah, they're looking at a 747 or something like that. Yeah, well, they, their speed would, they'd only be indicating about 250 at 38,000 anyway. Mm. See, it's all it's true airspeed you're looking for, but this is indicated. Yeah. So that would be indicated of the of the, um, of the aircraft. So if you do 250 at uh, at 8,000 feet, you're doing about probably nearly 300 knots. So um, well, they get along, and mm -hmm. if like that, they'd move. Um, and that's of course you'd have to have a lot more power on with a jet. Of course, the thing with a jet, or with this one, when we cruise with a piston engine aircraft, you're normally cruising at about 44% of takeoff thrust. But with a jet you're cruising around about 90 to 92 percent of your thrust. Mm. So you're dragging, you're not far from the maximum at all times on a yeah. jet. Eddie, thanks for joining us. Flying boats were in their heyday in the 1940s in Auckland, and one of the stewardesses going back to that time was Joy Hanna. You were Joy Patterson at the time. Joy, we're in the midship's cabin of the Solon flying boat here. It's a bit like being on a bus with a luggage rack up there and the sort of woodenish walls around it. What was it like to fly and was it noisy? Not as noisy down here as it was upstairs, and the galley was very noisy. But the exciting part was takeoff, and imagine it as a, um, a fast boat with the with the waves rushing past you. How we're close to the window? Oh, right up, yeah. right up beside the window. Because we're downstairs here. Not That's many right. aircraft today have upstairs and downstairs. No, no, we're, but we're downstairs here. Yes, and the belly of the plane would be in the water. Yeah. And we'd be, we'd be, um, the waves would come right up if, as we were taxiing along the harbour, the Waitemata Harbour. What was it like in rough weather? It didn't worry us. <laughs> oh, it worried you more when you got up. Yeah. Um, but uh, taking off, it, it didn't worry you. A, a, a boat had to go out first and clear any, um, any logs or yeah. anything like that in the harbour. Mm -hmm. Make it all clean before you took off. What was, what was landing like in one of these things? It was good. It was, I don't remember awful bumps, which I've certainly had since on the land. I don't remember that at all. Mm -hmm. it, it just, uh, you came down in the boat and sometimes a bit quickly mm -hmm. and uh, this, the water just spewing out from the side. And I loved that bit. <laughs> these, these weren't pressurized, so no. they get fairly cold when they Yes, and we had to fly under 10,000. We, we uh, upon occasion, had to go up higher, mm -hmm. but um, you had to watch for oxygen shortness, for altitude sickness. You had to. That's why we were all nurse trained. You were all nurse trained. All yes. The yes. Uh -huh. The six of us. We had to be a certain height, a certain weight, and nurse trained. And very good looking, of course. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> Two eyes and a nose. <laughs> now, if, if people did get altitude sickness, what, what would you do? We had special treatments to bring them, and we did carry an oxygen bag, but um, we'd, we'd bring the plane down immediately to about 2,000, mm. you know. But often in bad weather, you would be fly flying at 2,000 anyway, because you'd fly under the weather. Mm -hmm. You'd, you'd um, quite often be skimming across the waves. In fact, one of my greatest thrills was coming down very low, and the Bach Pamir was below, yep. and it was in full sail. Yep. 
and we we circled it twice before we went on our way to Sydney but it was a beautiful sight. It must have been a very much sought after job when you got your job too, Joy. It was. It was the first glamour job after the war mm. and um, we've been told, well it's been published, uh, 1,200 to 1,400 applicants. A lot of them would have been lost because they were too tall or they didn't have the necessary nursing qualification. Uh, but we were extremely lucky, the six of us who got in. Uh, I was a South Islander and uh, so that was a bit unusual. And the rest were, there, was, there were three of us who weren't from Auckland and we clung together a bit. <laughs> had you had any flying experience before you worked for Teal? Just coming up on the Dakotas from mm -hmm. the south and, and I had done it, uh, well at that stage I was just getting into the um, Tiger Moth. I used to go up to Mangere for breakfast and fly up there. What was it like the first day that you worked as a stewardess? I was scared boat? stiff. Oh, we we had a sort of we were had a sort of school. Um, th th nothing was established. We were new, and they didn't quite know how to treat us. And so we were to told, given a list of questions the passengers would ask. They never did. <laughs> <laughs> and then we and the answers. And we were also schooled in. Um, resuscitation sort of things for altitude sickness and that sort of thing. Then we had to cook, but um, largely it was learning from the seat of our pants. Uh, my first flight, you flew with a steward, always a steward and a stewardess. By the way, we were flight stewards and flight stewardesses, which I like much more than the patronizing hostess, mm. because it gives a feeling of service and we were giving service to the passengers. But the first one, the steward suddenly said, a man became very sick, and um, the steward said, oh, he's got altitude sickness, and rang up to the skipper to tell him. I went up the gangplank to the skipper, and I stayed with him, and I thought, that looks like epilepsy to me. So I treated him in the way epilepsy was treated in those times. And uh, when he, the steward captain came down, he just snorted and said, yes, I had been right. But there were all sorts of problems. I had a woman going to labor with me uh, on my plane. Um, all kinds of things happened, and you really did need some expertise in that way. Joy, we're up in the galley now. It's a surprisingly big galley. For an aircraft. Now, on this one, everything was cooked aboard it, I believe. That's right. This was an innovation. Each uh, oven shelf was electrically heated so that they could cook anything on, on these. They're all got their own elements in them. And the whole shelf plugs in? Yes. On top, there's one uh, element for making omelettes. And they had a hot water yes, heater over here too. Yes, hot water. And they also had a fridge. The fridge, we, we didn't have a fridge. And so that was great to have ice for the drinks. Of course, this was a later aircraft. This solid. was a later. About what year did this fly? 50, this flew from 51 to 1961, I think. Mm -hmm. mm. 10 years. It and did a million miles. A million one. miles? Mm -hmm. Yes, in the air, a million miles on the coral route. There's a lot of Toyotas that aren't going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> And these are all the storage cupboards here. Yes, and all the china cupboards, all the cutlery, everything had a place and it was well pinned down. You have to be very organized. They'd set up the trays and uh, 40 odd trays and very organized. There were two stewards and usually once the main steward did the cooking, I understand, and the stewardess and other steward were helping and setting out. And of course there were the drinks. The we'll drinks. have a look at that. Yes. Well, these came later than ours. Our ones, we went around and offered them drinks and sold them at half a crown a bottle, uh, spirits and a beer. And um, we controlled them. On occasion, we'd close the bar if things got a little bit um, mm -hmm. bumpy or if passengers became obstreperous, which could happen. Quite a famous man had to be stopped drinking at one stage. But this one became a kind of shop and... Uh, There's a little the hat, and the bar's here. And there's all the drinks. But in, in my time, they were half a crown. 
So, for whatever. So but Esther Law Stewart would, would have to stand here and would sell the drinks. Take the drink orders, yes. And, um, and this is all part of the galley. Yes, part of the galley. <laughs> but it was very successful with the, with, um, with the passengers. There was no class in those times. It, it, um, no business class, no No, nothing. Class. Everybody was equal. And uh, we'd usually put the smokers upstairs because of smoke rising and the mothers with children downstairs. Because this is a double, uh, virtually a double-deck aircraft, isn't That's it? Right. There's a deck up here and there's a deck down below. That's right. And very comfortable. Lots of leg room, which would be the envy of today's travel. Mm. Support maintenance on the airframe and the engines was meticulously carried out by Teal's own engineers, the Basin Mechanics Bay. From 1944, George Bolt was chief engineer for the company, responsible for the development of the technical headquarters. Ray Gasbridge is an aircraft engineer, working on the engines on these big Solons. When did you start, Ray, as an aircraft engineer? I started in 1941, in July 41, uh, and spent uh, that time in the engine shop at Mechanics Bay, a very small shop by comparison with today, uh, and had the advantage of being trained by some rather competent tradesmen mm -hmm. uh, in the use of old hand tools, the thing that they don't do too much today, yeah. and uh, worked actually then on engines and engine components. Mm. Uh, and later, uh, I was, became involved uh, in the propeller shop. In those days, the propellers were a uh, separate item, yeah. and the propellers and governors, we used to, well, I worked on those. What was it like working on an engine the size of this? This is a fair sized engine, isn't it? How many cylinders? Well, the, the Hercules is a 14 cylinder sleeve valve radial, so it's a twin seven row, twin seven row unit, mm -hmm. and this particular one on the Solent produces something like 2,050 horsepower on the shaft. That's now, each engine, so you're looking at engine. over 8,000 horsepower That's between right. the four yeah. mm -hmm. motors. Yep. When you say 2,000 horsepower on the shaft, What's that mean? Right, it, that's the actual horsepower that can be uh, placed into the propeller itself. And mm -hmm. remember, the propeller is just a great big ducted fan, really. Yeah. It's moving a large amount of air rearwards, and the reaction to that eff effort is uh, the forward thrust. So it's the amount of effort that the shaft will actually put into the propeller itself. How the, reliable are those motors? I think they were pretty reliable in their day. Um, uh, it was good maintenance, good overhaul procedures, uh, mm -hmm. worked very well. The very early ones, the very early Perseus engines, which were also sleeve valve engines, they were only nine cylinders, and they were on the, what is known as the C-30 boat, that was the first, or the, the, um, uh, the first short, short Empire boat. Uh, they uh, presented all sorts of problems during the wartime, um, and with particular regard to spares, because spares just weren't available. Yeah. How similar to a car engine are they? I mean, do they have spark plugs? Are they, are they, they have spark plugs, they yeah. have magnetos, they have starters. Yeah, just exactly the same. The only difference in the sleeve valve engine is instead of having poppet valves that are opened and closed by uh, tappets, uh, which most people would know, um, these have a sleeve between the piston and the cylinder itself with a series of ports in them. And at the bottom of the sleeve is a crank and as the crank turns, it rotates the sleeve up and down, but it also turns it as well. Mm -hmm. So it has a, 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 spiraling, a, a spiraling action up and down, mm -hmm. and it opens and closes ports in the cylinder itself. Very efficient way of doing it, actually. Mm -hmm. when, when they've done X number of hours, these things are overhauled, aren't they? That's right. How long would it take you to overhaul an entire Hercules engine? Good question. Um, I would say probably, you're, you're probably looking in the order in a workshop of about, um, Probably a week or ten days, uh, and that would involve perhaps up to 12, 15 people working on the mm. engine. So you're getting a lot of man hours in to do that, and it would depend on, on the condition yeah. at the time. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, do you strip the engine right down and it rebuild was, it? It was stripped right down to it, right down to the last nut and bolt. Uh, it was then cleaned. It was inspected, uh, minutely inspected. Uh, in those days, we thought it was extra, but by today's standards, it wasn't. It wasn't quite as uh, uh, sophisticated as it is today. Yeah. But however, everything was checked visually, 
And as far as metal parts were concerned, uh, the, they were all crack checked, mm. either magnetically or or uh, by die printing system. I've uh, got to ask you, Ray, when you put them back together, did you ever wind up with a number of pieces left over? No, no. <laughs> usually, usually, as they went through, every part was, um, when the engine was stripped, it was all put onto a tray. Mm. And as the parts were checked, they were replaced on another tray. Any parts that needed to be replaced were replaced at that point and the old part thrown away. Mm -hmm. I might add, there's a down under, near the container terminal now, there must be an absolute host of um, pieces off the early aircraft that were thrown and dumped in the harbour because in those days, of course, the harbour came right up to the waterfront. Yes. Um, there's a lot of stuff down there that would be very interesting to get hold of today. Is that right? Yeah. With, with these huge engines, wasn't it a daunting task taking one apart, something the size of this? I mean, for me, a, a motor mower engine is no, pretty daunting. No, not really, because it was done in, in a... Um, an organized manner and mm -hmm. there was there was a process to to follow very carefully uh, the only thing about it was it was a dirty job yeah. extremely dirty uh, how did you get the engine out did you take the engine out of the wing yeah well uh, as far as a flying boat is concerned as you've seen we've got beaching gear on the airplane, yep. so the aircraft normally was pulled out of the water uh, and you went ahead then to do your engine change on, on what we called on the hard mm. so that you were, you were stable and you had a mobile cranes that could come in and pick it up. In this case here, in the case of the solvent, the engine mount itself is just a four-legged mount and there's four pins and um, sleeves and the pins and sleeves were removed, the engine lifted and carried away. It could be done on the water, mm -hmm. um, but that wasn't so easy. And uh, But it could be done. It was necessary, for instance, in some outstations to actually do an on-the-water on engine replacement. No. How, how would you say these engines rated compared to, say, a, a, a similar sized jet engine? Well, the, the big thing is that the piston engine required overhaul and a much shorter life. And, and I would say probably you've got about 800, 800 to 1,000 flying hours out of the piston engine, whereas today jet engines, of course, are operating uh, basically on condition. And in many of the newer ones, uh, they only replace... Uh, components, uh, certain components in them, for instance, turbines and the hot section of a jet engine may be replaced, uh, may be changed about every 6,000 hours and so the engine may go through to 12,000 14,000 hours of actual flying mm. so yes, a jet engine gives you much longer life and of course the aeroplane is travelling faster so you yeah. get more, more uh, efficiency in that respect From the mid-1950s on Teal phased out the flying boats and began using land-based DC-6s operating out of Fanuapai Air Force Base. In 1954, the last remaining solent was retained for the popular coral route from Auckland via the Cook Islands and Fiji to Tahiti. She made her final touchdown on the 15th of September 1960. One of the more unusual float planes that became a familiar sight to Aucklanders during the war years and up to the early 50s was the amphibious PBY Catalina, used in its wartime role as a submarine reconnaissance craft. With its wheels down, it could land and take off from land, while its boat-shaped hull and wingtip floats allowed it also to land or take off from water. In the air, both the wheels and the floats retracted, the floats folding up to become wingtips. One of the last surviving examples of this odd-looking plane was lost between Hawaii and New Zealand in 1993 on a flight from the U.S. to Auckland after it had been obtained by a group of enthusiasts. 
After Teal shifted to land operations, the seaplane base at Mechanics Bay was used by tourist air travel. The outstanding personality in this operation was Captain Fred Ladd. This bubbly character would send the amphibian Grumman charging down the concrete slipway into the tide and hurtle off with a cry of a shower of spray and wear away. Tourist air travel were a familiar and welcome sight around all the islands of the Hauraki Gulf, where the pilot would drop the plane on the water in a bay and then run straight up onto the beach, where the passengers could alight without getting their feet wet. They operated as charter aircraft, delivery wagons, sightseeing flights, ambulances, and in any other role they could fill. Altogether, tourist air travel operated five Grumman Widgeons from the Mechanics Bay base, and when the company was sold to Mount Cook Airlines, the planes continued to fly in their new livery until the next owner, CB Air, purchased them and flew the faithful old Widgeons through to 1984. When CB Air folded up, the planes were sold, and only one is now still in New Zealand in private ownership.
25th anniversary of the opening of Auckland's International Airport at Mangere in 1992, aircraft from all over the world took part in the biggest air show the country has ever seen. One that attracted great interest was this giant Russian military amphibian. From Vivian and Leo Walsh to the mighty Russian seabird, the Waitamata Harbour has seen the rise, the glory and the decline of seaborne aeroplanes. <laughs> 